All right. Hey, that is season number four of The Chosen. Highly recommend that you uh, begin watching that if you have not already. And what we're going to do over the next 10 weeks, uh, we're going to pull different episodes from The Chosen, and then we're going to take them to their text found in the scripture, and we're going to teach, preach from that. So today, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take those out, open those up. Matthew chapter 16 today, uh, we're going to begin in in verse 13. You know, there are many significant questions that one may ask and answer in life. Uh, why am I here? What is the origin of the universe? What should I do now that we are here? How shall I spend my time? Am I lovable? What is truth? Where should I focus my abilities and my attention? Why do I cheer for the team that I do? I mean, all of those are great questions um, that, that demand an answer. And questions like those of great consequences, right? Uh, they're worthy of our consideration. So this morning... Uh, we're going to spend our entire time thinking about uh, two questions that Jesus asked. And the weight of these questions, I think, could and should ask of ourselves. And, and really, this first question that, that we're going to look at today uh, is the question that surpasses all other questions in life. And how you answer this single question question. And, and please hear this. All of us answer it. Uh, we answer it either knowingly or otherwise, but we have and we do answer the question. But it is eternity defining. It is reality shaping. And the question is this, who is Jesus Christ? Right, that's the question. Who is Jesus Christ? That's not a new question. Uh, people in the first century to us now in the 21st century, we find ourselves facing this question being asked to us and us having to provide an answer to it. So Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13, and we're going to read how they answer it. That is, people in general had an answer, right? And then the disciples in particular had an answer. And then you and I are going to be faced with this same question of who is Jesus. So if you would do me a favor over in the West where I was earlier and those of you in here, would you please stand if you're physically able for the reading of God's holy word, the scriptures, the, the Bible. Matthew 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or maybe one of the other prophets. But then Jesus asked, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, or Bar-Jonah, some of your texts may say, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And now I say to you, now I tell you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. So let's pray. And this morning, uh, we're going to look at how the people answered the question, how Peter answered the question, but then in front of us is going to be the question that we have to answer, who 
is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you for the privilege it has been already to worship you with others. God, to declare that your name is the highest name, that your name is holy, that you are the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of the living God. And so, Father, it is in that name that we worship, that we call on now, that your Holy Spirit would take your Holy Scriptures And God, would you challenge us this morning? God, would you encourage us? God, would you convict us? Lord, would you bring us to a deeper understanding of who you are and God, who you desire for us to be? Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. God, I pray that for each person here today, they can sense your presence. Uh, Lord, they feel your power. And God, they would know that they are surrounded by your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. You know, in today's uh, day of uh, engagement, uh, the proposal uh, is obviously important, but it's almost taking a back step, uh, a back seat to that of the place or the setting in which the proposal actually takes place. Uh, That was not true when Sharon and I uh, got engaged some 32, 33 years ago. Uh, No one knew that that was taking place. Uh, No one knew where we were going. There were no photos. Uh, Then we went to uh, my parents and and her parents and uh, our siblings and family and friends and shared later. But today, man, it is a production. Like, uh, God bless some of you who are thinking about uh, this thought of engagement uh, to the thought of possibly being married. Uh, Because it's not just the pressure of are they going to say yes to the question, but is the setting the right setting? Is the place the right place? A lot of pressure with that. And we see this in Matthew 16, verse 13, the very first verse we read. It says that Jesus came. That is this. Jesus intentionally takes the disciples to this particular place. Uh, He's got camera people hiding. They're going to jump out in just a couple minutes. Uh, It is the right place that he's picked to ask them this all-important question. So Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. Now to you, you're like, well, who cares, right? But there is a big deal to this place that Jesus chose to ask this question. Just imagine this. You're walking into a place that is steeped in darkness. It is filled with false idols and pagan worship. Matter of fact, it was known as the entrance to hell itself. That's why it's referred to as Hades. That's, this is the location that Jesus chose as the background to this question that he's going to ask. Now, of the main natural features of this location, there's these huge, this huge rock, and you can see where there are multiple places of worship that have been carved out. There is temple after temple built to one God after another God. Some have referred to Caesarea Philippi as the strip mall to false gods. So that's kind of the location. Like, pick a spot. They're all the same. They're all selling the same stuff. Just which one do you want to jump into? And this place Caesarea Philippi is where Jesus is going to bring the disciples. It was a place, by the way, that Jewish people avoided at all costs. You know, it's amazing that Jesus kept taking his disciples to places where no one else said you were allowed to go. And so Jesus goes to this location. He's got his disciples at the headquarter of false religion to do two things. Number one, to confront the darkness. And this is the place where there was false religion. I'm going to say false churches that Jesus is going to establish, not a religion, but a relationship. But this is the place that Jesus is going to establish the true church, his church. And once there, 
He doesn't preach a sermon. He doesn't give a speech. He doesn't start a debate. He doesn't speak against all of this. You know what he does? He asks a question. Matter of fact, he's going to ask two questions. So Caesarea Philippi. This is the place of the great confession of our faith. Like, this is the location, and I find that it's very interesting that Jesus would go to Caesarea Philippi. Think about some other cities he could have gone to. He could have gone to Rome, but Jesus didn't need man's political endorsement. He could have gone to Athens, but Jesus did not need academic certification. He could have gone to Jerusalem, but Jesus didn't need the religious establishment. And so instead, he goes to Caesarea Philippi. Why? Because Christianity is not about culture or political approval. Christianity is not even about theological viewpoints. It's all about Jesus. Like that is the basis, that's the foundation for everything that we believe in. It is Christ and Christ alone. So by this point in Jesus' life, there have been a lot of opinions about who he is. And so Jesus takes a moment to ask the disciples as they are standing in this location, probably right in the face of of the huge cutout in this rock that was truly known as to the gates of hell. And I believe it is in that spot that Jesus is going to ask one important question. Now, unlike some of us remembering in school where the teacher would ask us like a hundred questions and you had to pull out your number two pencil and begin writing if they even use number two pencils anymore. But that's the way it was back in the day, right? Jesus isn't going to ask a hundred questions. He's going to ask two questions. But in asking two questions, the first one doesn't even count. The first one's basically just write your name on the, on the test, right? Uh, just put your name there. It is the second question, though, that is pass or fail. I mean, there, there's a lot of weight on this second question. So let's look at their answer to the first question. Who do the people say Jesus is? Now, know this. Jesus opens by casting a wide net, Right? Like, imagine what he's doing here. Well, if we were to say, like, if everyone was able to give their opinion, right, on who Jesus is, this all-important question, who do people say that the Son of Man is? This is a big question. That's a wide net, right? And Jesus is essentially asking this. Um, where have the masses landed on this, is he or is he not, the Messiah thing, right? Like Jesus wants to know. Jesus is asking a question that none of us in the room could ask. Uh, what's the word on the street about me, right? Like if we were to ask, unfortunately, uh, our disciples would say, got to be honest with you, uh, there's really no word on the street about you, like good or bad, no one's talking about you. But that's not the case about Jesus. Everyone had an opinion. Everyone was talking about him. Uh, one of my favorite authors uh, is a guy named Watchman Nee. Watchman Nee was a pastor in China, and uh, he would regularly preach uh, to uh, his congregation in Shanghai of an audience to six to 7,000 people. But more important than preaching, uh, he was a gifted writer. He's, he's known for, credited to starting over 200 house churches in China alone. And uh, what's great about Watchman Nee is uh, some of his books are like really thick and others are more like, you hate to call it a book, it's more like a pamphlet. Uh, I mean, like it is super small and you go, why? And, and here's, uh, for 20 years, uh, Watchman Nee spent time in prison and or labor camps in China because he would not stop preaching or writing about the gospel. 
Matter of fact, they came to watch Mene and said, if you'll just leave the country, <laughs> like just get out of here, we'll let you go free. And he refused to do so because he felt called to preach there, to share the gospel. He's known for this famous quote. Good is not always God's plan, but God's plan is always good. Now, you may go, ooh, that's good. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> uh, good is not always God's plan, but God's plan is always good. And I want you to know, that's not just a good quote. It is good, right? But think about this. He wrote that in his 20 years spent in prison and in labor camps. Uh, Watchman Nee, uh, just real quick side note. The, the reason some of his books were really thick and some of his books were really small because he was in prison and he would write them there. And here's the thing. He would, uh, his goal was in writing, he wanted the books to get out. And so he spent most of his time trying to convert the, watch, the, the guards, uh, those that watched over Watchman Nee. And uh, sometimes he was able to share the gospel and the spirit of the Lord would convict them and, and they would get saved quickly and say, whatever you feel like God's calling me to do. And he would say, I think God wants you to get this book out to the believers. And they would abandon their job as a watchman uh, in the prison, and, and they would distribute the book. So some of his books were really small because it took like no time at all for him to lead someone to Christ. Some of his books are really thick because the guy he was trying to share with was pretty thick-headed, right? So it took longer for the Spirit to work on him. But Watchman Nee made this argument in his book, Normal Christian Faith. Which, by the way, he says basically the faith we live is not normal. So he writes this book called The Normal Christian Faith. Very similar to statements that C.S. Lewis made. And basically, Watchman Nee said this. A person who claims to be God, you belong in one of three camps. So anyone, including Jesus, who claimed to be God, falls into one of three camps. First, if he claims to be God... And, and, yet, and yet, in fact, is not, then he is a madman. C.S. Lewis said he's a lunatic. Or second, if he is neither God nor a lunatic, then he must be a liar, deceiving not only himself, but others by his lie. And then third, if he is neither of these, then he must be God or Lord. Because you can only choose one of the three possibilities. So C.S. Lewis would say this. Either Jesus was a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. Uh, Matthew 6, 14, the next verse says, They, meaning disciples, they replied, not their response, but of what they've heard. Some say, Jesus, that you are John the Baptist. Others say, Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Now, the disciples are responding maybe to uh, an informal poll that they took. I'm not sure. They're, they're just sharing. Hey, here's the word on the street. And notice the supernatural element. And the chosen did a great job of explaining this. Notice the supernatural element of their answers. For Jesus to have been any of those, right? John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the other prophets, it would have meant this, that Jesus came back from the dead because all four of them at this particular time had died. So in other words, here's what's happening. The people have recognized that there's something special going on with Jesus. And, and, and they see similarities between Jesus' works and Jesus' words that they've experienced and that they were expecting from the Messiah to come. But know this, they were wrong. That Jesus isn't John, nor is he Jeremiah. And so we, they admit that there's something special about him. Maybe he was a prophet, maybe a wise man, a spiritual man. But that's where they stopped. He's special. But he's not my savior. 
And, and that was the response of the people. And I would say that nothing's really changed in 2,000 years. That today, there's still this wide range opinion when it comes to who was Jesus, but probably even more important, who is Jesus? You know, in, in, in my over 30 years of being a pastor, um, I, I've heard more people than I dare to recall say something like, my Jesus would never, and then there's this blank that they fill in. My Jesus would never say that. My Jesus would never do that. My Jesus would never ask of me this or that, right? But here's the truth. You don't get to make your own personal Jesus. You know, in most cases, there's the real Jesus, and then there's the Jesus that we've all made up. Like our own personal Savior, but not like our personal Savior. But this personal Savior, it's, it's a lot like Burger King, right? Like we want a Jesus made our way. Or it's Build-A-Bear, where we want to assemble a deity that fits us best. Uh, there's this real Jesus, and then there is a fake one that we make up. And, and, and really, uh, it is a deified reflection of us. Like, I like this, so my Jesus is going to be. I, I don't like that, so yeah, my Jesus is going to be against that. But again, you, we don't get to choose who Jesus is. Uh, it reminded me... Um, when I was in college, when we were on the road, we, our coach was obsessed with this place called Golden Corral. Uh, we probably were the only team uh, that ever went there, but we always went there, especially on Friday nights. Man, that was his place. And we would go, and uh, some of the boys, uh, some of the concoctions that they would come up with, I mean, they'd come back, and they would have a plate overflowing with like a yogurt parfait, uh, some spare ribs, sushi, an omelet, and then, of course, the ice cream. And it's like, how did you like decide to mix all of that together? And, and basically what happened was when they were in the line, like that's kind of what looked good to them. And, and I think a lot of us would like to have a Golden Corral Jesus. Like we get to go through the line and the things about Jesus we like, we put on our plate, those that maybe, you know, convict us or go against us or it's a hard truth about him. We're like, yeah, I think I'm going to pass on that, right? But we don't get to choose. And some people claim, you know, Jesus is a great teacher. Others say he's a radical zealot. Others say, you know, he was just a nice guy. And then there are those who say, no, he's just a figment of humanity's imagination. And I believe still today there's those who just go, you know, there's something special about him. But he's not my savior. In other words, the response is the same. It's rejection of the true Jesus. But Jesus isn't discouraged by their answers. Matter of fact, I, I think he's going to re-aim the question. And I get the sense this is what he wanted to do all along. And in Matthew 16, 15, it shifts. And he says this, but what about you? Speaking to the 12. What, what about you? He asked, who do you say I am. So who do the disciples say? Really, we could say, who does Peter say? Because he's going to speak for everyone else. And in verse 16, it says this, Simon answered, you are the Messiah, meaning the Savior. You are the Son of the living God. And, and I hope that you see the contrast in those answers. People versus Peter. Right? Here's what we see. There's uncertainty with the people. There is certainty with, people, with Peter. Peter believes Jesus isn't just a teacher or a zealot or a person who's very special or even spiritual. No, Peter says that you are Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the long-awaited one, the much-needed one. You are the Son of the living God. He's not just one of the prophets. He's not just one who was predicted about or they ate for. No, he was the Messiah. 
Peter's leaving nothing to the imagination, declaring that Jesus is the unique one. Jesus is the other one. That Jesus is deity, that he's a savior. That there is no one else like him. That's how Peter answers the most important question that's ever asked. Because Christianity isn't about a ritual or a routine of Sunday morning worship. It's not even a body of doctrine. It's not a code of conduct. It's not behavior modification. You know what Christianity is? It's a person. Christianity is Christ, and Christ is God the Son. Matthew 16, 18 says this. Now, remember, uh, Jesus says, what do they say? What do you say? And now Jesus says. Jesus is going to say something now. And what does Jesus say? In verse 18, I tell you or I say that you are Simon, son of Jonah. But now you are Peter. And Peter, on what you said, that I am the Christ, the son of the living God, I'm going to build my church. So the people say, Peter says, and now Jesus says. And Jesus says, I'm going to build my church. Now, notice whose church it is. I'm going to build my church, meaning the church is the bride of Christ. And of all the things Jesus could have built, you know what he chose to build? The church. And he's not talking about a building. You know what he's talking about? You. That Jesus wants to build in you the hope of glory. That Jesus wants to build in you what 1 Peter 2.5 says. That you also are living stones being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. Meaning this. That we're pieces of drywall and concrete, lumber, carpet, and paint. Being fashioned by an all-powerful, all-knowing builder upon this foundational truth that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. So church, hear this. South Tampa Fellowship, it's not my church. It's not Pastor Chris's church. It's not our trustees' church. It's not our committee members' church. It's not even your church. South Tampa Fellowship belongs to Christ. It's His church. He's building it, but guess what? He wants to use you. Like He wants to use you in this labor. Uh, Third thing as we close today, who do you say? we, We know what the people said. We even just heard what Peter said. But the real question that we have to engage and examine is this. Who do you say? That's the final question. And and I'm convinced it's pass or fail. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said this. It matters little what others say about Jesus. Listen, whether they're right or wrong. But what is your say? Who do you say Christ is? This is the question that every person must answer. And your answer, I believe, is the difference between life and death, salvation and judgment, heaven and hell. That's why this is such an important question. And it's part of why, a couple weeks ago, we had all of our missionary partners here. It's why we support the work, not just locally, but globally. It's why we have eight church partnerships, because people should be able to hear the thought behind this question of who is Jesus. John 17, 3 says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So you know what eternal life is? It's to know the true God. That means to know Christ as your personal Savior. So how do you answer this question? What is your response? Is it like the Peter? Is it like Peter? Or is it like the people? 
You know, contrary to uh, popular opinion, there's only two options available regarding the response. There's the right response, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then there's the wrong response, which is anything else. Jesus doesn't give us a choice. You know what Jesus said? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father unless you come through me. So you, you can't go over him, under him, or around him. You have to go through him. So this day, is Jesus who Peter confessed or who the people guessed? But what is your answer to who is Jesus? I want us to look um, just for a moment. Because Jesus says something that I believe is extremely helpful to us today. Here's what he says. And the gates of hell, or Hades, will not prevail against it. Think about this. Gates. Gates are meant to what? Keep people out and to protect what's inside. Meaning this, gates are defensive. So really the thought is death, sin, shame, and, and really hell. It's defensive. And Jesus is declaring, guess what the church is supposed to be? Offensive. Like the church is supposed to go. That's why we call it the gospel, right? Like it is moving and Jesus' great commission to all of us is as we are moving or as we are going that we are to make disciples, teaching them everything that you've already been taught. That's the beautiful thing about disciple making. Because a lot of people say, I just don't know enough. Well, what do you know? Well, I know this. Well, teach someone who doesn't know that. Like, that's part of the movement. That's part of the going. And this is the power, the power of the confession that Jesus is the Christ. It's not just a statement. It's actually a declaration of war against darkness. Like, you don't have to hide in fear. We're on the attack. We stand on this statement. Jesus called it a rock. So we stand not on shifting sand of our culture, but we stand on this rock. We're not just spectators. We're warriors in the kingdom of God pushing back the darkness. It's O time. Like, we're not on defense. We're on offense, and, and so many of us sit back, and sometimes we sit back because we're afraid. Sometimes we sit back because we're just soaking it all in. But I want you to know, like, we're called to move, and here's where it really gets personal. The gates of hell aren't just out there. It's not just a place. It's not just a location. But the gates of hell can also be in you, meaning this. Uh, sometimes it's in your head. And you become your worst enemy. Sometimes it's in your heart, the things that you feel. So sometimes it's in our home. Sometimes it's in our habits. Sometimes it's in our struggles. And some of us have allowed the gate of anger, the gate of fear, the gate of shame, the gate of doubt to set up in our lives. And others of us are, are facing these gates, maybe in, in, in relationships that we're a part of, maybe our career, maybe in personal battles, maybe even in our marriage or parenting, maybe in our friendships. And it feels like, man, there's a gate. But understand, the gate is defensive. It's not offensive. And Jesus is saying something. I've given you the keys. Like, what do you do? Unlock the gate. Walk in and stand on the rock. Jesus said, the keys to these gates have been given by his authority. Uh, I, I, I read that and I remember going back to high school. And in high school, I don't know why, our PE coach, and some of you got to go back with me. The shorts. Every PE coach in America had the same shorts on. Some of you know. And uh, 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 always tucked in a polo, right? Whistle. And then like 8,000 keys. I don't know. Like he, There's no way he knew what all those keys went to. And if you ever ask for the keys, like, ooh. You're asking for the keys. Like, yeah, I need to unlock the room that, you know, our four volleyballs are in. Like, I'm not, somebody's going to take those, right? Or the kickballs are in. Like, yeah, I just need the key. All the guys ask me if I would ask you, hey, could I have the key? And he goes, well, you know, if I give you these keys, 
pretty powerful. You could do a lot. I went, I just want to get out of dodgeball. Really, that's all I'm looking for. Like, not planning on doing anything else. But you know what he's, he said? Like, he's wanting me to know these keys come with authority. You know what Jesus is wanting you to know? These keys come with authority. Jesus even says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. You know what Jesus is saying? I'm giving you the keys. So go and open up whatever gate is stopping you. Tear that down. Claim victory in Jesus' name. And this is why you need to understand the enemy wants you to doubt who Jesus is. Because if you, adapt, if you doubt who he is, therefore you're going to doubt, does he really have the authority? Does he really have the keys? Or do I need to go to somebody else more powerful, more important to get the keys? So he's going to get you to doubt who Jesus is. That's why it's so important that you answer the question, who is Jesus? And like Peter, when you say he is the Christ, the son of the living God, give me the keys. Then you can go and unlock these things that have held you in bondage. Or the enemy will try to discourage you. You don't even know how to use the key. <laughs> even if it was given to you, what are you going to do with it, right? You don't know how to use it. And that's the beautiful thing about the Spirit of God living in us, shows us how to unlock those gates in our life. But remember... If God is for you, then who can be against you? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Matthew 16, 19. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. We have the keys of to unlock the doors to the kingdom. But listen, not just for us. But do you realize that you also have the keys to unlock the door of the kingdom of heaven for others? That it could be your invite. It could be your testimony. It could be your God story. It, it, it could be you sharing the gospel with someone else. That unlocks the keys, that, that unlocks the doors of the kingdom of heaven for them. And that's why we have to share the gospel, stand for what's right, to bring hope to the hopeless. So here's the challenge. Identify the gates of hell in your life. Confront them. Understand you have the authority to unlock that gate and to walk through them. You know, again, maybe it's a, a gate of addiction or fear or lust or pride or a relationship that's pulling you away from God. Maybe it's a lie that you continue to believe about yourself. Or maybe it's a lie that you're believing about God. But whatever it is, you have the authority to overcome it. So decide today, hell doesn't win because Jesus won. Hell doesn't win because Jesus won. Please hear this. Hell doesn't get to win in your life. Jesus won. The scripture teaches us that we are more than a conqueror. Now, I don't know what that means. Like, I know what a conqueror is, right? Like, I know what it means to be victorious, but what does it mean to be like you're victorious, victorious? Like, you're more than anything in Christ. You're more than a winner in Christ because Jesus won, and he's given you the keys. So use them. Father, thank you. Uh, Lord, thank you for the love you have for us. God, I, I thank you for this declaration, proclamation, bold statement, and really the confession of our faith that Peter says, you are the Christ. You're the Savior. You're the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. And God, our scripture teaches us that it was because of your sacrifice that our debts were paid, 
That we were made whole, complete, new in you. Given a new heart. Not one that was cleaned up, refurbished, but a new heart can be planted in us. So church family, with your eyes closed, heads bowed. I just want to ask, for you to answer inside, who's Jesus to you? Do you know that one time Jesus actually tells us who he is? He doesn't say, I'm mean. He doesn't say, I'm angry. You know what he says? I'm gentle and lowly. You know what that means? I'm humble. You, you, I love the part where he says, I'm lowly. The Greek word there is, I'm accessible. And this morning, you know what that means? That the gate to salvation is accessible. That whosoever wants to come can come. And this morning, if you for the very first time want to answer the greatest question ever asked, who is Jesus? He's my Savior. He's my Lord. He's my everything. Because He won. I'm going to guide you in a prayer. No magical prayer in the Bible, please know that. But the Bible does say, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. So I'm going to just guide you in a prayer. And if, if you've never invited Christ into your heart, to, to, you've never declared in your mind who Jesus is, even with this prayer, would you so do so? Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me so much that you sent your only son, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, your only son, to die for my sin, to pay my pardon. So, Father, I confess my sins to you this morning. I call on all of heaven to cleanse me, to save me, to forgive me. God, thank you for giving me the keys of salvation. God, help me to walk and to live as someone who's imitating you living for your name, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.